Welcome uh, to this afternoon session on a little bit of Redis and Spring Data. My name is Christoph Strober and I work for Pivotal Software uh, as part of the Spring Data team. So I'm responsible mainly for the Redis module itself, but also get my hands dirty with uh, the Spring Data modules on MongoDB, JPA, a little bit of Spring Data Commons uh, if necessary. I don't have that much experience with Cassandra, but I hope to get into that one uh, as well, since it's a core module uh, for a while now. Okay, uh, what is Redis actually? I mean, who, who in the room is already using Redis? Oh, almost everyone. That's nice. I, I hope it won't be too boring, because this uh, we're gonna talk a little bit uh, about Redis first to explain the concept, but I'll try to keep this rather short to not bore you too much. Okay, Redis is the remote directory server, as you probably already know, uh, invented by Salvatore San Filippo in Sicily, and who developed it out of a need because he needed a, a key value store, a rather fast one uh, that he could talk to over the network. And this is basically the main purpose of Redis. It serves as a key value store. But it's not only a key value store, it's also used as a cache. Uh, it's used for some, some kinds of period. It's people use it for distributed logs. With the reason 3.2 version, we have uh, geo-indexing capabilities. Uh, you can use it for analytics using the bit operations. And it also serves as a session store in under some scenarios. If you take spring session, for example, uh, you can just uh, store your session data inside of Redis. And to serve all those purposes, Redis has uh, several data structures within. So we got strings, normal strings, we got lists, sets, we got sorted sets, hashes, and some uh, a data structure for hyperlog log, uh, which is uh, pretty fast in counting unique things. So if you want to count tra unique traffic hits on your website, probably by IP address, you can easily do so by just using the hyperlog log structure and DPF commands if you want to do so. Uh, on top of that, Redis offers some PubSub uh, capabilities, pub, uh, publish, subscribe. It has a sort of transaction capabilities. We'll talk about that later a little bit. And you can also execute a Lua script uh, inside of Redis on a single node. So that all is uh, Redis and built into Redis. And let's have a short look at the data types and commands to understand Redis a bit. So basically, uh, Redis doesn't care about the type of data you put in. It's just uh, bytes uh, as far as Redis is concerned. And we have plain strings. So those consist of a, a key, obviously, which is a series of bytes and value which is also a series of bytes. And you can just go on and set the key with a given value. You can also obviously get it out, uh, the value by the key. You can get and set, also you can get the existing value and set a new value via the get set command, or uh, set a value if uh, the key didn't exist before. You can ask for the length of a string, you can, uh, you can append something to a string. You can get ranges uh, out of the string via their indexes. And there is a special characteristic to those string operations. So if your string happens to be a number, you can apply several numeric functions onto that string. So you can basically say, hey, increase that stuff by one, increase it by a floating point number, and what have you. And of course, you can also do the same, uh, just decrease the value. Then we got uh, the list data structure, which is uh, just like you know the, the structure from, from Java. So you have a list of, of values. You can have duplicates in there. It all works pretty fine. So you can just add stuff on the left, and you can get something from the list, or remove it, and get it back uh, with LPOP. You can push something to the list on the right and remove it from there. You can ask how many elements are currently within uh, that list that you stored under the key. You can set uh, elements at a given position to a value and you can get it from there. Pretty obviously, just like we have the stuff in Java. You can insert stuff, you can get ranges, and you can remove uh, from either the left or the right uh, a number of values depending on 
uh, the prefix if it's positive or negative that decides which uh, side to remove from. Then we got uh, another data structure set which doesn't allow duplicates just as in Java. So we have uh, the Lannisters in here. You can add something to the set. Uh, you can just take a random element out of it with the spop command. You can use the uh, members command to just get all of uh, the elements within the set and you can remove stuff from the set by a certain value because uh, Tywin obviously got killed by his son, so there's, there's no reason to keep him in the set anymore. Uh, you can ask how many items you have in your set and if a certain value is a member of the set by uh, the sys member command. You recognized already the pattern, all the set commands start with S. And we got sorted set, and since the S already is taken as a prefix, uh, those are called C sets for, to indicate it's a sorted set. Okay, uh, again, this is a set. It does only allow uh, values once, and uh, each value has a score assigned, uh, so that you can basically order them via their score. Uh, in this case, we got them ordered by some kind of birth date. So Tywin was first, and then the, those two twins, Kerse and, and Jamie, and then came Tyrion. Okay, so we can see that add stuff to the, to the set, given a value and a score. We can get uh, a range from there using the index, or a reverse range, just in reverse order. We can also retrieve elements uh, via, by their score which is a Z range by score or the Z ref range by score command. We can ask how many items are currently in there and uh, count that stuff and also get the score for a specific value. And of course we can just uh, influence the scoring by use, issuing the set increase by command and just increase the score of a, a given value. And of course, we can again remove Tywin from our list. Then we get uh, hashes, also very similar to the Java data structure that we have. So there is the key Daenerys, uh, with last name Targaryen. She's obviously a queen and has uh, pets as uh, dragons as their pet. And you can just set uh, values there, get them out. Uh, HM set cause uh, gives you the opportunity to just add multiple keys and values to the hash under that key and you can also get multiple values back from from it by just issuing the hm get command given the several keys you can ask for the basically size of the hash and you can remove uh, elements from the hash itself you can ask for keys values and of course uh, both of them obviously Great, let's move on to some uh, geo commands. So the geo API that was introduced in the 3.0 line of Redis, we're currently, current version is 3.2.4, if I remember correctly. So it's been there for a while already and it's pretty capable. So if we look at the data structure, it basically reuses uh, the CSET structure. So what we have there is basically uh, we have the keys with uh, the their longitudes and latitudes and the score. And the score itself is a 64-bit integer, and I hope I get this right now. It takes the the even bits are the longitude and the odd bits are the latitude of the of the geo uh, geo coordinates. And I always get a little bit of a headache when, when I think about it, how you interleave that stuff to just execute range queries on it. But it works obviously pretty fine uh, and is pretty fast. So we can just uh, geo-add some stuff there, given, uh, let's call it, uh, we have Westeros as a key, and then we just geo-add uh, a key with uh, Castle Black and uh, Longitude and Latitude, which results in this core. We can ask for the geo-position of, uh, of an uh, element within the geo uh, index. And this doesn't always return you the exact position that you originally put in there because Redis does some kind of approximation to, to fit it in there. So don't, 
it's not really an error if you don't see the exact longitude and latitude numbers come out if you issue that command. That's by intention. You can ask for the distance uh, between two points, uh, two existing points, and you can ask for the geohash representation as well as uh, the georadius uh, command that allows you to just uh, define a point uh, and it will and the radius and it will give you all known elements within that radius by just interleaving the 64-bit uh, integer score. And of course, you can ask it also for all the elements within the range uh, with the with the given member as its center. And uh, yes, you can't actually remove something issuing a geo del command as you would expect because this is a C set, as already said, and so you have to remo remove elements using the C rem, C remove uh, command from the C set, actually. And yeah, King's Landing almost got destroyed. I mean, you could apply this as well to Winterfell, obviously, but let's remove it from there. Okay, Redis uh, transaction capabilities. Um, for those who don't know, Redis is single-threaded. So it's when you ex when you issue transactions, you basically send a multi command to the server, which puts the connection you're talking on uh, into some some queuing mode. So each command you send there is is not executed immediately, but just queued up for later execution. So if you set a key and a value, it gets queued on server side, and if you get the exact same key back uh, with the command, that command also gets queued until you basically call execute, which will then return you a list of all the results uh, of the commands you queued up before. So it would basically return OK for the set command and then the value back for the get command as, as a list. If you want to discard that stuff, just as you discard, it will clear up the queue and will return OK. And the transaction stuff is since it's single threaded, all those is executing and interleaved uh, during the execution of the queue. So this is how Redis uh, handles uh, those stuff. Okay, that's all for a very quick intro into Redis data types and now let's move on to actual uh, what it looks like to interact with Redis uh, and you typically start off with a, a single node Redis instance. Good. I mean you can Redis is open source, so you can basically go to redis.io and download it from there. Uh, one word of caution, you have to, to build it locally first, so it won't work on Windows machines because you have to issue a make command. So preferable, you use some, some Linux derivative and then just uh, issue the, the make command from there. Okay, I've already downloaded it and built it. So let's fire up a, a single Redis instance by just calling the Redis server command. This will start up pretty fast because it's an in-memory database. Uh, it's pre-configured with uh, an append-only file, so every command I issue is written to an append-only file and can be reloaded on startup, so if the server crashes, it just replays all the commands and then rebuilds the state from, from there. I can start interacting by using the Redis CLI that comes with the Redis distribution. Just fire it up, it will connect to, to the Redis server and we can just go on and set he won uh, Java, and this gives us okay. Set key two, key two day, and let's call as at one two three. Okay, cool. So I can now go on and get my key. Uh, I can basically use the the command as members to get uh, this one back there. So we got two and three back out of that uh, set. And this is pretty easy and straightforward to, to interact with, with Redis. I can also ask for all the keys by just using the keys, um, sorry, the keys command. And uh, one word of caution about the keys command since Redis is single threaded. And the keys command is a blocking command. It will basically until it has finished block your server for at that time. I mean, there is there is a, a scan command as well that will just give you parts of your your keys for each iteration. So it's the the blocking 
characteristic is, is, is shorter. And that's, that's one thing I really like about uh, Redis pretty much is that it, for each and every command you can go to the Redis website and it will tell you exactly about its runtime complexity. So you can pretty much predict how long each and every execution will take your server and for how long it will be blocked. Most commands have a pretty, pretty decent uh, runtime behavior, so most of them is O from one or uh, such things, but you can predict it pretty much what you're doing. Okay, so this is a single node Redis instance, pretty easy, pretty straightforward. The only problem that, that you have is basically when your server crashes, uh, then your application, whatever you have, is basically dead for the moment because you, you can just cannot connect anymore. So as with every system, resiliency is, is pretty, pretty important. Let's move on. Uh, with Redis, you basically have, have more opportunities to just uh, make your system fail safe, and this is, uh, in first place, add uh, slaves to your server. So you have a master server and that replicates to several slaves. Uh, the Java drivers basically handle that and allow you to read from the slaves uh, back uh, once the server goes down, but someone has to take care of restarting the server and monitoring all that stuff. To make this thing a little bit easier, Redis has a concept called Sentinels, which is a special kind of server that monitors your cluster, so your master and your slaves. It has a, a configuration file, and so it basically detects once a master goes down, then there is a configuration that those all those Sentinels have to agree, okay, that server is down, uh, this is confirmed, three of two servers confirmed the master is down and elects a new master node out of the slaves, as long as there are slaves available. And if the old master comes up for whatever reason, it just rejoins as a slave. So this is, works pretty nice and you have all the commands at hand and it works out of the box. The Java drivers are capable of just switching between all of those. I mean, it, it has some kind of latency, so you have to be prepared and just... Uh, deal with uh, a potential outage, uh, but it will recover by itself. And then we have cluster. Since the 3.0 version, this is the, the main new feature in the 3.0 three, uh, line. So, and what cluster does, additionally to the monitoring, so there are no sentinels, but the cluster talks to each and every node uh, constantly. And what cluster does, it, it automatically has sharding. So what does that mean? Uh, each master node in a cluster is responsible for a slot range. So there is 16,384 slots available. Each of those slots can have as many keys, um, yeah, basically it cannot have unlimited keys within one slot. But each and every key is assigned to a specific slot, which means it's assigned to a specific node. Within the cluster and the distribution is transparent. So this is very important to know. Let's have a look at uh, how uh, a cluster looks like. It was in the 3.0 line pretty hard to spin up a cluster because there was some, some Ruby script in there which was called Redis Trip and you had to, to read a lot of uh, how-tos. And with Redis 3.2 this got really easy. So there is a, in dash, a util dash create cluster. There's a create cluster script. And if we have a look at the help file, there's just start a cluster, create a cluster, if you started it up initially, you can stop a cluster and you can clean all the nodes so this removes all the configuration file. So let's see how this works. We just uh, say create cluster, start a cluster, and then just create the cluster. So what this does, it spins up uh, three master nodes, adding, let me just scroll that up a little bit. And then we add uh, a replica, a slave to each and every node, uh, every master node. And what we see here is, th is the slot assignment that utility takes care of us. So there's three slots and those, uh, these slots get uh, assigned to the nodes accordingly. Plus the replicas then just taking that stuff from there. Okay, let's play a little bit with the cluster. 
by just uh, call using the Redis CLI again, issuing it with the uh, dash C command, which tells the CLI, okay, you are now interacting with the cluster and giving it the port, uh, one is a nut, the port of one of the nodes. So this will be just the first node. And then we can again go on, set key one, Java. Mm. Oh, I should have accepted. Yes. So I forgot to do that before. So I wanted to scroll up. So now I've accepted the cluster configuration, which is obviously required. Okay, now I can go on and set uh, the key one. Now I can set key two, fields, Java day. Feels pretty much like uh, interacting with a single node. But hey, wait. Uh, that just happened there. So this is the, the slot assignment. Key one is actually served by the node I was actually connected to while uh, key, key two mapped to another slot. So I was redirected uh, from Redis. Uh, so Redis originally returned a, a moved command and what have you, an error, and the DCLI just took care of it and redirected me to a new, new node. So this is basically uh, the third node within the cluster that I have uh, now. Okay, fine so far. Java drivers are also capable of handling that stuff. So let's s add uh, my key. One, two, three. Works pretty fine. Seems to be on the on the same on the same stuff. Okay. Now let's go on and uh, s members my. My key works pretty fine. And then I call m get, which is a multiple get command, so I can get multiple keys, key one, key two, and ouch, this didn't work. Uh, why does this happen? Because since we're Redis distributed the keys to several nodes and slots, you cannot you can only execute the command on a single slot. So all if you issue a, a command that maps to multiple slots, where this will give you an error. So you cannot basically interact with it uh, like you would do within a within a normal uh, Redis environment. Because uh, can you please connect again? Okay, I'm get key one to works pretty fine. So you see there's there's a huge difference. Uh, we can bypass that behavior a little bit by cheating on Redis, because there is there is the ability to just pin more or less uh, keys to a certain slot. So how do we do it? We just say uh, set, give it a, a prefix, key, key one, if you will, value one and then set key to value two, which works pretty fine. And you see there, there is no redirection, so we stay on the same node uh, currently. And this happens because uh, Redis inspects uh, that stuff you have, you use as a key inside those curly brackets, and it uses the, the innermost element. So. If you're using a cluster, please don't use JSON data as a key, because this you, you won't find your data again, and JSON is likely to change, so your slot mapping might change pretty fast. And now we can obviously can go on and issue the mget command by calling key one, and oops, E2, which now works pretty fine since they both map to the same slot. If you want to know uh, which slot that is, you can just issue a cluster uh, key slot and then just let's say key two and it will give you the, the slot that you have. You can look it up yourself. Fine. Uh, one more thing I want to tell you about cluster, and this is uh, like those commands that you would expect that we have, uh, like keys command, which gives you all all the elements within your your Redis uh, instance, and within the cluster, again keys it is. Uh, it only gives you 
all the keys that on a particular node. So it won't give you an accumulated view on what you have in your cluster, but, but just what you have on, on that single node. And this is something to be aware of. Uh, who of you is, is using uh, a Java client, uh, Jedis, anyone? One, two, three. Uh, anyone using the asynchronous counterpart, Laddish? No one, okay. So Laddish handles in the 4.2 version, handles that out of the box, so it can issue uh, a keys command that will collect that stuff for you. Uh, Jedis won't uh, and probably will never do. Um, so you have to be aware of that. Okay. And that's pretty much the part, uh, the general part on Redis. Uh, let's have a look on how Spring Data Redis uh, can help you interact with Redis uh, and helps you uh, dealing with uh, especially cluster issues. Okay, to do so, uh, Spring Data Redis uh, has some building blocks. Uh, first of all, we got a, a template, as you might be familiar with, a, a JMS template. So this does just the resource handling and exception handling and all that stuff. The template uses a connection factory that can give you an abstraction to the actual driver because we support multiple drivers. So there's Chedis and there's Lattice. It's up to you which one you want to choose. So there is a connection factory and this gives you an abstraction of the connection or a cluster connection, depending on your configuration. And the template makes use, of the connection by the way, uh, talks uh, only binary. So it, it just takes bytes, byte arrays and sends them uh, to Redis. Uh, the template itself has something called a serializer that allows you to use a more advanced types. So you can use a JDK serializer which will just create a byte output stream and just pushes that to Redis or converts that stuff into a string or uses whatever checks and mapping library you have to create something for you, uh, a byte array, and just use that for the connection. Depending on that, your keys and value representation within Redis uh, differs, obviously. Okay, and then we got the, the Redis driver, uh, Jedis and Lettuce, which are currently supported by Spring Data Redis. Okay, but now let's have a look on how uh, Spring Data Redis can help you interact with a cluster. And what we basically do, um, we have here the, the uh, use case collecting all, the, you want to have all the keys within the cluster. And we have an abstraction, so we got a string connection that takes just the strings. We have the, the key one and two that we sent obviously to node one and node three, and then we want to issue the keys command and assert that that stuff works and we get all the keys back. Uh, we're using Chedis in this case, so this is the synchronous stuff, um, and this works pretty fine. What we do in the background is we have something called a cluster a command executor that basically takes your command, inspects all the keys, uh, figures out, oh damn it, those keys are distributed across slots, not only nodes, but really the slots matter. And then we go there asynchronously, split up the request, issue multiple requests, collect the, the result, bring it into the right order, if order matters, depending on the Redis command specification, and then just return and hand back the result to you. So it's pretty transparent for you if you're interacting with a cluster or a single node instance from a Spring Data point of view for you as a programmer. Internally, we handle the requests pretty differently. Uh, and if you wanna go the route that you are just interested in all the keys that are stored on a specific node, then we just go really the other way around. So you have to define the node you wanna talk to and then issue the command on that specific node. So this is what this actually does. It takes the connection, issues a key command on a specific cluster node. And yeah, this is just because we are talking binary there and convert it back and collect it to a list. Okay, so we would have uh, three keys, two on one node and one on the other, and then just go there, ask that one node, don't care about the other one, return it back to me and works pretty fine. We also support you with uh, those cross-slot errors that we saw before that you can't get multiple stuff from there. So we also detect that one, just 
go there, fetch them one by one, combine the result, restore the order for you, and then just hand it back to you. So your upgrade path from a single node instance to a cluster is pretty easy. We also support the, the non-sharded version with the Sentinel, works also pretty fine. It's up to you uh, which uh, setup you choose. Nice. Let's move on. We got 20 minutes left or so. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about, uh, which is uh, not really new, but uh, new in the terms how Spring Data handles this since the last release is the object hash mapping. And if you think about it, uh, we normally we live in a complex world and normally don't deal with just a key and the value, but rather more or less complex objects such like a, a person that has a string, a first name, last name, maybe a complex uh, address type in there, which is an address. And uh, one approach is to just uh, use uh, some JSON serialization and just store that string that results from that serialization under one key. So this is a set command uh, for uh, the person with an ID and then just push it there. Pretty valid. I mean, the downside is it works pretty well. Nothing wrong with that approach. Uh, the only the downside is you have to go through that serialization over and over again. Uh, so uh, all you basically can do is just get the whole thing out, uh, and that's basically it. Uh, there is not many operations you could do in there. You cannot uh, just go in there and update something within that object because you have to serialize and deserialize the, the entire object. The other stuff is just object hash mapping, uh, which takes all the properties in your domain model, flattens them out uh, into a hash, and then stores that particular hash inside of Redis in, in, a Hedish, uh, in a Redis hash itself with an HM set command. So you again have the key, which is the ID. Then you potentially have something that identifies the class you, you stored there, because it might be an interface, an abstract class, what have you, if you don't know and want to keep it generic. And then you just flatten out that stuff like the address with a, a dot and country and then store the rest in there. And now you're, you're pretty open to what you do with the data you have in there. So you can just retrieve everything back, uh, which is quite equal to the get command we issued before, but now you have the opportunity to do something like a projection. Just get parts of your data out there because you're just interested in ID and last name, so you just issue hget all that stuff out, or ask if uh, the property age exists for within that hash and all that stuff. You can also do just updates on specific attributes by just saying h set and then passing the property path and the value itself. So you're, you're more flexible in how you deal within the, with the data within Redis itself and make use of the capabilities Redis has. Okay, let me quickly show you how that works. So the object hash mapping. This is pretty easy. It's uh, just a Spring Boot application, and we have something called the Object Hash Mapper that has been introduced in the in the last release. Uh, that thing uh, uses a meta model, so it inspects your domain type once, and then just uh, reuses that meta model to store and retrieve the uh, data you give it. Okay. So what we got here is uh, we got John Snow, who was whose address is Winterfell in the north. And then we just go on and map that thing to a hash and uh, set it. That's basically all we do. Uh, we're using a string connection in here to just have it readable. And then we just load it back from, from Redis. Let me quickly execute that. Works pretty fine. Uh, this is the, the map representation down here, and I can show you that one. We are not using the cluster anymore because uh, kind of hard to predict. Uh, keys. Yes, there it is. Uh, get all. Give it the key, and what you see here is basically the, the flattened out uh, data structure that for storing that stuff and for retrieving that stuff back again. And now you can go on, and this is the second test more or less, and then just 
set specific attributes within that hash and what we assert here is that the thing uh, we inserted before isn't the same after we updated it, basically. This works pretty fine as well. And again, this just uses the metadata extracted out of your domain model as you, as uh, basically by the same mechanism that we use within uh, Spring Data Commons for all the other stores, so like MongoDB and U4J and all that stuff you probably know. Great, so this is one way of uh, storing your data pretty easily. We take care of the mapping, we treat uh, lists and maps correctly, so those go into brackets, having an index, so the, the order is pre-saved. You can even um, nest those, those stuff, there is cycle detection in there that uh, stuff gets aborted. You can have references and all that stuff. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, secondary indexes uh, in Redis, because Normally, you just have uh, a key to retrieve your your stuff back out of Redis. And sometimes you want to be able to have uh, more than one criteria to find your data. And this is exactly what secondary indexes are for. And how this can work. So you basically store your stuff in there. And then you could use, you don't have to, but you could use a set to just store specific attributes. So you have a, a set per per, index, per lookup function, more or less, that stores the reference to the ID, to the original ID. So if you want to index the first name, basically, you have something called uh, the first name, index all persons with uh, the first name John, and just add, keep adding IDs to that set, which looks like more or less like this. So you add uh, one, two, three to that existing set. Uh, you could also have another set, uh, which uh, for the last name, let's, let's say it's Snow and has the same ID. And what you now can do is basically you can intersect those sets. You can not only ask for, for give me all persons with matching, but you can intersect those sets by using the sinter command and you have basically an AND query created. So you can ask for give me all persons with first name John and last name Snow and you did it within Redis. Or a simple or query using the sunion command works pretty fine. Uh, you could also use a C set so that you got some, some sorting in there and all that stuff, but it works pretty fine with the, with the sets and be careful with C sets because it only takes tables as a score or, or 64 bit integers. Uh, in Spring Data, this all is abstracted away using a Spring Data repository. So, all you have to do is you have to annotate your domain types uh, with a Redis hash, just telling for a, a certain key space. And use brackets if you're in the cluster to just uh, make use of all the Redis capabilities because your data will be mapped inside of Redis to the same slot. So Redis can compute it internally, otherwise you would have to do it outside in Java code. Uh, using the abstraction, and then just add, uh, add indexed annotations to the stuff you want to have an index for, and Spring Data will take care of the rest. So you basically just call repository save. This will use the object hash mapper we saw before for storing your data and will set up the indexes for you. Uh, you could also issue uh, an update command and by just calling repo update, give it a new partial update for the class and set uh, whatever property you want to, uh, which issues the h uh, set command. But it's not as easy at the, uh, as this is uh, because you have to be, uh, look up data before because you have to potentially remove the old value from existing indexes to just keep that stuff concise. And this is something we also take care of. So we go there, we just recognize there is already an, uh, an index for the value that existed there before. We go to that index, remove the value there, and then just add the value to the new index. So pretty transparent for you, but uh, uh, a lot of stuff going on, uh, on behind the scenes to, to make this all work. And of course, uh, Spring Data is uh, more or less famous for its derived uh, query methods. The same applies to the uh, Redis repository abstraction. So we allow you to have 
simple find those errors. So you can have equal comparisons, just like find by first name and last name, as we saw before, or John Snow. Uh, this works, you can have concatum with or, but there is no basically starts with and all that stuff that's simply not possible at the moment. I know there is DC range by lax command and all that stuff. We're working on it, we know it for the moment. Uh, this is what, what works and it works pretty fine. Uh, so you can just call it and it will issue the as inter command, uh, extract the IDs, load that stuff, give it back to you. You can even use paging if you will. Okay, we got 10 minutes left, pretty nice. Uh, let me just demo that stuff to you. This is the repository. So this is uh, the family Stark, including Jon Snow, and we just find by last name everyone who's within that fam uh, family and called Stark, so John obviously wouldn't match, and we just retrieve all that stuff back. Uh, yes, find by single property is green, or oh, works pretty fine. You can do the same using the AND. Uh, also, that should work, so this is basically ARIA, uh, and only ARIA and none of the other Starks. Uh, it works with, uh, with an OR query, and it even works with embedded uh, indexes. So we got uh, Adart, who whose address is Winterfell, and if we look inside of address, there is also an indexed uh, annotation on the city, and we can go on just by defining find by address underscore to make it really obvious that it's nested property, Winterfell and the city. And as you can see here, it's just the, the interface implementation that is then backed by the proxy generated by Spring Data. Uh, let me quickly run that one. Oh. Okay, pretty nice. Cool, that worked so far. Uh, this is the update case. Uh, so you set, maybe you got a typo within the first name and then you just assert uh, that it works. So let me just, exactly. set the first name to John, and we find by last name, we don't find Jon anymore, but we find, uh, uh, no, we find Jon and we don't find John anymore after the update. Cool, uh, one more thing I want to show you concerning that stuff, and that is something uh, special, because uh, if you know Redis uh, pretty well, uh, you know you can set expirations on keys itself, so you tell Redis, this hash or this object is only valid for a given time and then just drop it, throw it away, I don't care. And since uh, for, for some time, Redis now offers something called key space events. So you can basically subs use the pub sub mechanism to receive events emitted by Redis. And Redis will tell you whenever a key is expired. And you could now go on and add, uh, where is the, the add time to live uh, annotation to one of your properties indicating remove it after a given time. If it's a positive integer, it will just issue a TTL command and then just expire. And uh, we will also, if you want to have this, uh, you can also enable something that calls enable key space events. And this will, uh, allow you to receive those key space events and so that you can uh, register an event listener that gets informed whenever such a key expires, which is uh, nice if you think about sessions. So whenever a session expires, you get a notification that the session actually is now gone. For spring session, uh, sorry, for spring session, this was pretty important. Mm. And the one thing uh, that happens is Redis only tells you which key expired, but it won't tell you which va uh, what the value of the key was, actually. So what we do in, in Spring Data Redis is once we encounter that you have a TTL property there and the, the element is gonna, going to expire at some point, uh, we store a shadow copy that will expire five minutes later. So we can basically, we get informed by Redis, 
that the key expired and we can then load the phantom key and provide you with the values that had been there before in the, in the uh, event that is fired by the application context. Let me just quickly, where is it? Yeah, receive the expiration event. I registered the, the application event listener up there. It takes some time. There is the expire event for this key. This is what Redis tells us, and this is basically then the value of the shadow copy that we, we had in there. Great. So much to Redis repositories. There is a lot more you can use. There is an add reference annotation that allows you to not flatten out complex objects into your, your hash, but rather just store a reference to another hash, which is um, pretty nice if you don't want to duplicate data that much. Uh, the expire command I just showed you, you can ha register custom conversions. Uh, so this allows you to register for the address uh, if you want to store it uh, as a JSON string inside the hash itself. So you're free to just register a custom converter for the address that takes a JSON mapper and that stuff will get then stored. And you can use spell-based indexing, which is pretty neat if you're dealing with Spring Session itself. For the Spring Data Redis project in general, what's on the roadmap? Um, obviously, geo-indexing. Pretty straightforward, we have an address. The address has a point, which is a location. We have X and Y coordinates. We add, add geo-index. And once you save it, we just take care of maintaining that uh, geo stuff for you. So we issue the geo-add command for the property with the lot types. Um, and you can then go on and just define queries like find by address location near, give it a point, a distance, and this will give you a list of persons. Or you can also have a list of, of geo results with average distance and the distance in total and all that stuff. We take care of that for you. Pretty nice feature. It's already in master, so it will be in the next release, hopefully. Uh, yeah, this is just the geo radius command I talked before. And of course, big topic for Spring Data 2.0 in general is the reactive programming model and the adoption of this. So this won't be in the next release, but in the 2.0 release of Spring Data Redis, and this is a sneak peek on uh, reactive programming using the Lattice driver that has already a reactive API. Uh, for those of you who know RxJava and are, find those names there a little bit weird, this is Mono, this is Project Reactor that uh, Spring 5 will be based upon for the reactive stuff. So Mono is basically a single and down there the flux uh, translates to an observable in general. But those are the types and uh, we will support reactive streams. So all the commands will take a publisher of something and but then return you so, so that you're free to use any, whatever type you want but then will return you the reactor types as Flux and Mono and all that stuff. We are pretty far with that approach already, working on the 2.0. Already this is not the only project that's going to be having reactive APIs, so there will be MongoDB. I guess the Couchbase guys are already working on it. Um, there will be something for Cassandra, uh, giving you a, a spring-based programming model for reactive uh, data access. In the first step, of course, for the NoSQL stores, because uh, GPA is, is obviously a different kind of beast and currently it doesn't allow us to have any reactive uh, API there at the moment. Great, I hope you enjoyed this session. Thanks for spending some time uh, with me at this Saturday afternoon. And if you have questions, just ask me now or yes, please. Uh, thank you. So actually, as I, as I understood, uh, there is uh, no load ba balancer uh, in the Redis. Pardon? Uh, load balancer. There is no uh, in the Redis. Am I right? There is no load balancer in there. Yes. Yeah, so um, um, could we have some uh, situation when uh, all our uh, entities will be stored on the one single node and another node will not be used. How, could, how we could avoid such situation? That 
Uh, let me just repeat the question. So you want to know if for, when for all your, your, your entities are stored on a single node. Yeah, uh, so well, for example, we are using uh, Spring Data and store a couple of entities to the Redis. Yeah. And uh, such entities are, are stored on the one node. And yes. another node is just not used. Uh, could we have such situation and how we could avoid Yeah, uh, you can, you're free to distribute your, your stuff across the cluster, just leave out the, the curly brackets in the Redis hash and it will just go on and distribute data across your cluster and just find it together back again. So this is all handled. Just It's just a, a hint to, if you're working in a cluster, just define those namespaces within curly brackets because you can then make use of the Redis commands internally that are written in C and are pretty fast. Otherwise, we, you would have to go through those command executor, just connecting to the nodes and do intersection and all that stuff within your Java code, which is obviously less performant. I mean, it's transparent, it works, but we recommend to just stick it to one node and use maybe four categories that's pinned to another node if you have connections between the, those, those two. And for a failover, the cluster deals, let's call it that way, itself by just failing over to the next slave as long as there is one. If you run out of slaves for one specific node, your entire cluster will be dead. Not only that part of, not only that slot range. Thank you. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, when someone uh, uh, trigger a case command, uh, the cluster is blocked, right? Uh, what will happen if someone uh, else uh, trigger any commands? Is it blocked only for reading or for writing? No, no, it's, uh, you can't basically issue any, since it's single threaded, if you issue the keys command and it has a runtime behavior of O of N, then until it's finished, you cannot do anything on that single node. I mean, Redis is pretty fast, don't get me wrong. It's really fast, so it won't take long even if you have millions of keys in there. It's just the time it takes to just iterate over that stuff. That, that's all. There is uh, Redis only spins off a new thread for Oh, no, it wasn't dumb for, for some replication stuff to just write stuff to disk, but that's all. So am I right that in uh, CIP term, uh, it stands for consistency and uh, partitioning, basically C and P, right? Pardon? Uh, in CIP theorem, uh, it stands for consistency and partitioning, not uh, the availability, because it's it can be blocked uh, for some operations for some amount of time. Oh, can we take this offline? I, I'm not sure if I, I got the question right. Just step by later. Sorry. Can we run in that log situation when we put data to a Redis grid? For instance, we have a Redis, which is, consists of three instances, and we push some key value pair. And yes. then uh, the one that we push, the key value falls down at this moment, and the whole grid just dies. Yeah, the, the last one always wins in, in that situation. You cannot make sure which, which one, I mean, the, first, uh, the, the last one overrides yeah, always. I, the, I mean, I mean just, it, just, it just came to my if mind. If there's if, multiple is clients. Is it theoretical just the block situation that Redis does, doesn't, doesn't survive in this case? Pardon? Is it, is it possible just this deadlock situation in this case? In this case, the, the whole... You, you won't... Uh, how, how would you run into a deadlock? Uh, I don't quite understand the question there. Because, because do I get correctly, if I push some value to a uh, Redis grid, then this value should be spread along the whole grid, right? Oh, you mean it, it's yes. distributed in the cluster. Yes. So, uh, yes, that, that's an issue that you can run into, but all the clients have a, a max redirection a limit that you can set on driver level. So basically, it's the default is five, if I remember correctly. So after five hops, it will just terminate and give you an error. So no, no round trips there forever. But 
that's something you have to hand, you have to configure on the on the Java driver level that you're using. So both Jadis and Laddish offer you capabilities to do so.